So around 1951, a book was published in the United States called The True Believer. The author was Eric Hoffer, and the book was about how mass movements start and operate. You might think that Eric Hoffer was a university professor, but nope, he was a fellow with no college education. He worked uh, as a migrant worker, picking crops, as a gold prospector, as a dock worker. But his book, The True Believer, instantly made him famous as one of the great uh, social philosophers, I guess you could say, of the 20th century. He went on to publish a few more books after that. But uh, it's this book, The True Believer, that I want to talk about today. Really see how what it has to say about how mass movements work and how, of course, this channel talks about Jehovah's Witnesses mainly and see how it ties in with how Jehovah's Witnesses actually have formed and operated over the decades. I first heard about this book uh, listening to a Mormon Stories uh, episode where the uh, man being interviewed talked about how the way he laid out how movements form with the early leaders kind of paralleled exactly what how the Mormon religion started. And as I was listening to him, I was like, wait, that's exactly how the, the order of the early Jehovah's Witness leaders were. That's interesting. And then just recently, I was watching a video from uh, Mark Manson, who wrote that book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. He mentioned the book, The True Believer, as one of the most influential books that he had read recently. I thought, well, you know, I just better read this book for myself. And I would definitely give it a two thumbs up. It's one of those, I've kind of felt reading it, it kind of felt like when I first read the book Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan. I mean that in the sense that the book, at least the first edition of Combating Cult Mind Control, had no mention at all of Jehovah's Witnesses. And yet when you read the book, you're like, whoa, this is describing exactly how the religion works. And the same way in many instances was with reading The True Believer. I was like, oh, that's why things work this way in uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So I just made a few notes as I went along of points that jumped out at me, and I thought we could go over them here. The first few parts of the book talk about the appeal of mass movements. And he begins in uh, section one. So just to explain, the book is divided into chapters, as any book is, but also this book is divided into about 125 sections, which are basically like subheadings. And so I'll kind of refer to the the subheading numbers or the section numbers because they're pretty handy. But in section one, he talks about one thing that can cause a mass movement is the desire for change in people. And um, remember, this book was published in 1951, so just after World War II. So he had a lot of uh, movements that he could draw on to analyze the communist movement in China, uh, Nazism, the rise of Russian communism, and, uh, and of course, he also mentions religious movements. And that's one thing he touches on in this first section is that he says in the past, religious movements were the conspicuous vehicles of change. He says the conservatism of a religion, its orthodoxy, is the inert coagulum of a once highly reactive sap. A rising religious movement is all change and experiment, open to new views and techniques from all quarters. I think that's true of the early Jehovah's Witnesses, the early Bible students, things were very loosey-goosey, still formulating what the religion would come to be in the future. In section seven, he discusses another reason that some people may be attracted to mass uh, mass movements, and that is the desire for substitutes. And he, he forwards this idea that he returns to a number of times in the book that many of the early uh, converts or followers of a mass movement are folks who are not happy with how their lives are and may feel them spoiled. And this movement has gives them the opportunity to try and move past that uh, and find success uh, in, in other avenues. So this, this is a little more difficult to swallow <laughs> as a former member of a mass movement like Jehovah's Witnesses to read his uh, theory of his that, oh, broken people are <laughs> the most attracted to movements. But I, I think it's a little more, I think I discussed this a little bit in my video a while back about how Jehovah's Witnesses turn people into ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, that people attracted to a movement like that are, they are seeking some kind of, something that's missing from their life. And 
I know for me, uh, you know, you're always the most depressed when you <laughs> had to go work in the super well-to-do territories of the congregation because it was so difficult to um, have any sort of success there. And I'd far rather go to the radiest rundown areas of the territory because even though you couldn't set your book bag down on the ground so bugs wouldn't crawl in, but the people were so receptive in those areas and you, you'd have a ton of success. So um, I think there's some truth to what he writes here. He, he makes an interesting point in section 11. He says, The burning conviction that we have a holy duty toward others is often a way of attaching our drowning selves to our passing raft. What looks like giving a hand is often a holding on for dear life. Take away our holy duties and you leave your lives puny and meaningless. There is no doubt that in exchanging a self-centered for a selfless life, we gain enormously in self-esteem. The vanity of the selfless, even those who practice utmost humility, is boundless. So that's an interesting point. I think that is true of, uh, at least for me as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, that well, we felt very humble and who are we before Jehovah, but at the same time, you do have that sense of superiority to uh, non-witnesses, and so even though you're trying to help help them s- get saved and go into paradise, you do feel superior for that, you know, secret knowledge that you've learned uh, from the organization. In section 14, he makes the point that there is an interchangeability uh, between movements for the adherents, and so uh, he's talking about like communists and Nazis uh, in that time period. They were both kind of um, trying to gain the same followers and and even um, gain each other's followers. So a, a communist might be a very ripe convert to Nazism and vice versa. Uh, they were kind of primed to join a mass movement. And I know in my experience, I've seen that a little bit in Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember when I was a kid, there was this very zealous uh, lady that came into the organization and got baptized from the territory. She converted and then, like six months later, she started, uh, <laughs> she, I remember her bringing uh, LDS Mormon missionaries to the Kingdom Hall, and that caused a stir to see these two young men come in with her. And before you knew it, she had converted over to the LDS church. And everybody was like, oh, my, it was a big talk of the congregation for a little while. So that's kind of interesting that there can be the shifting of, of people from one movement to another. So part two of the book is talking about potential converts and the types of people that join mass movements. In section 25, uh, Hoffer writes about the difference uh, between immediate hope and distant hope that movements will use for their adherents. Uh, He says, a rising mass movement preaches the immediate hope. It's intent on stirring its followers to action, and it is the -the around-the-corner brand of hope that prompts people to act. Rising Christianity preached the immediate end of the world and the kingdom of heaven around the corner. And he goes on to give some other examples. And then later he says, as the movement comes into possession of power, the emphasis has shifted to the distant hope, the dream, and the vision. For an arrived mass movement is preoccupied with the preservation of the present, and it prizes obedience and patience above spontaneous action. And when we hope for that, we see not. Then do we, with patience, wait for it. They're quoting from uh, Romans 8.25. He says, Every established mass movement has its distant hope, its, its brand of dope, to dull the impatience of the masses and reconcile them with their lot in life. Stalinism is as much an opium of the people as are the established religions. So I think we see this with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that It started out, and there's been time periods where there was definitely the immediate hope was the main thing. That's kind of how it started out in the 1870s and then shifted to 1914 that just in just a few years, the paradise would be there or they would be going to heaven. 1925, we saw that, 1975. But as those dates kind of came and went each time, there was definitely a shift to the distant hope for Jehovah's Witnesses and as he, he mentions, that's because there was now things to protect in the present, the organization and its assets and uh, its influence they had over people. In section 32, he makes an interesting point that most mass movements will try and weaken the family 
bonds in order to strengthen the bond that they have on their followers. And he ties this, he mentions, for example, how um, World War II Germany split up the uh, families into concentration camps and whatnot, moving people around to different parts of Europe. Uh, interestingly, he writes that still not one of our contemporary movements was so outspoken in its antagonism toward the family as was early Christianity. And he mentions a number of verses there talking about where Jesus, you know, said you have, need to be ready to expect that families will split up if you want to follow me. And so in groups like the LDS Church, I think uh, it's not quite as obvious as it is among Jehovah's Witnesses where children are just sort of a tolerated necessary evil in the organization and really people should be ready. Even marriage is not encouraged. And really, it, the best thing, I think, in the organization's eyes is when everybody's just independent little units that they can go off to pioneer or serve where the need is great. And that family bond is uh, really weak. And, and obviously, things like disfellowshipping and what was further, you know, the organizational rules serve to further weaken family bonds. In Section 34, he writes that, to, for a movement to be successful, it needs to be able to absorb all comers into the organization. He writes, It's futile to judge the viability of a new movement by the truth of its doctrine and the feasibility of its promises. What has to be judged is its corporate organization for quick and total absorption of the frustrated. Where new creeds vie with each other for the allegiance of the populace, the one which comes with the most perfected, perfected collective framework wins. And I think that's uh, one of the strong suits of Jehovah's Witnesses is that they will take all comers. Uh, no one's excluded from being able to join the organization. In section 36, he makes an interesting point that one group that's particularly primed to join a mass movement is uh, military veterans. And uh, I thought this was really interesting when you consider that both Anthony Morris on the governing body and Sam Hurd uh, are both uh, military veterans. So really, <laughs> you could say a quarter of the governing body has our military veterans. Eric writes that the man just out of the army is an ideal potential convert, and we find him among the early adherents of all contemporary mass movements. He feels alone and lost in the free-for-all of civilian life. The responsibilities and uncertainties of an autonomous existence weigh and prey upon him. He longs for certitude, camaraderie, freedom from individual responsibility, and a vision of something altogether, altogether different from the competitive free society around him. And he finds all this in the brotherhood and the revivalist atmosphere of a rising movement. And I think if we, when you read Toni Morris's life story that he published, those sentiments come through loud and clear in his post-Vietnam years until he joined Jehovah's Witnesses. In section 42, he makes the interesting point that virtually every mass movement will seek to have uh, criminals join it. <laughs> and certainly Jehovah's Witnesses are no different in going to prisons and jails to try and gain converts. He writes, an effective mass movement cultivates the idea of sin. It depicts the autonomous self not only as barren and helpless, but also as vile. To confess and repent is to slough off one's individual distinctness and separateness, and salvation is found by losing oneself in the holy oneness of the congregation. Section 3 of the book talks about united action and self-sacrifice. In section 44, he writes, he talks about one of the factors that promotes uh, members being willing to be self-sacrificing is identification with a collective whole. He writes, to ripen a person for self-sacrifice, he must be stripped of his individual identity and distinctness. He must cease to be George, Hans, Ivan, or Tadeo, a human atom with an existence bounded by birth and death. The most drastic way to achieve this end is by the complete assimilation of the individual into a collective body. The fully assimilated individual does not see himself and others as human beings. When asked who he is, his automatic response is that he is a German, a Russian, a Japanese, a Christian, a Muslim, a member of a certain tribe or family, 
He has no purpose, worth, and destiny apart from his collective body. And as long as that body lives, he cannot really die. He goes on, The effacement of individual separateness must be thorough. In every act, however trivial, the individual must by some ritual associate himself with the congregation, the tribe, the party, etc. His joys and sorrows, his pride and confidence, must spring from the fortunes and capacities of the group rather than from his individual prospects and abilities. Above all, he must never feel alone. Though stranded on a desert island, he must still feel that he is under the eyes of the group. To be cast out from the group should be equivalent to being cut off from life. So I think the parallels to how Jehovah's Witnesses operate is pretty clear there, whether it's uh, dressing similarly, acting similarly, the strong connection to if the organization rises or falls is how the person rises or falls. And so I think that's pretty obvious that when you, a lot of times when you criticize the organization, let's say how it handles child abuse, uh, members, active members will take that as an attack on them personally. I think we see that too with, you know, Trump supporters or any, really any kind of mass movement. Um, These are pretty universal principles. And then in section 45, he makes the point that those who best endured the Nazi concentration camps were those who felt themselves to be members of a close-knit, compact group. And Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, fit in well with that. He writes, The unavoidable conclusion seems to be that when the individual faces torture or annihilation, he cannot rely on the resources of his own individuality. His only source of strength is in not being himself, but part of something mighty, glorious, and indestructible. Faith here is primarily a process of identification, the process by which the individual ceases to be himself and becomes part of something eternal. Faith in humanity, in posterity, in the destiny of one's religion, nation, race, party, or family— What is it but the visualization of that eternal something to which we attach the self that is about to be annihilated? Section 46 is an interesting parallel to Jehovah's Witnesses. He writes, The theoreticians in the Kremlin are probably aware that in order to maintain the submissiveness of the Russian masses, there must not be the least chance of an identification with any collective body outside Russia. The purpose of the Iron Curtain is perhaps more to prevent the Russian people from reaching out, even in thought, toward an outside world, than to prevent the infiltration of spies and saboteurs. The curtain is both physical and psychological. The complete elimination of any chance of emigration, even of Russian citizens married to foreigners, blurs the awareness of outside humanity in Russian minds. One might as well dream and hope of escaping to another planet. The psychological barrier is equally important. The Kremlin's brazen propaganda strives to impress upon the Russians that there is nothing worthy and eternal, nothing deserving of admiration and reverence, nothing worth identifying oneself with outside the confines of holy Russia. I think if you just uh, replace Russia and the Kremlin with the governing body and the Watchtower Society, uh, it fits pretty well. There's an interesting section in number 47 under the heading Make Believe. Uh, He writes, Dying and killing seem easy when they are part of a ritual, ceremonial, dramatic performance, or game. There is need for some kind of make believe in order to face death unflinchingly. To our real naked selves, there's not a thing on earth or in heaven worth dying for. It is only when we see ourselves as actors in a staged and therefore unreal performance the death loses its frightfulness and finality and becomes an act of make-believe and a theatrical gesture. It's one of the main tasks of a real leader to mask the grim reality of dying and killing by evoking in his followers the illusion that they are participating in a grandiose spectacle, a solemn or light-hearted dramatic performance. And I think there's some parallels with the Jehovah's Witnesses here that it's often that um, parallel is stressed that we're like actors in a grand play and the theater of the universe. And I, th- I, there's one, I forget if it's in the live forever book, but there's a picture of, uh, all the angels kind of, uh, arrayed around the earth, watching each of Jehovah's witnesses to see what they'll do in this grand court case that's being played out in the universe to see who stands firm for Jehovah. And the idea that there were, 
we're actors in this performance, uh, it does make it easier whether you're talking about dying for dying for not taking a blood transfusion or, or things of that sort or from, you know, persecution. It gives you the sense that you're in, involved in something bigger than yourself. In section 48, Hoffa writes about another important factor in promoting self-sacrifice, and that is deprecation of the present. He writes, at its inception, a mass movement seems to champion the present against the past. It sees in the established institutions and privileges an encroachment of a senile, vile past on a virginal present. And we see that in the early days of the Watchtower Society, where it was um, you know, pushing back against the false doctrines of existing Christianity. But he goes on, he says, To pry loose the stranglehold of the past, there is need for utmost unity and unlimited self-sacrifice. This means that the people called upon to attack the past in order to liberate the present must be willing to give up enthusiastically any chance of ever tasting or inheriting the present. He writes, the absurdity of the proposition is obvious. So he writes, it's very important for mass movements to make sure that their members are never focused on enjoying life in the present. They must always be looking to the future. He says, not only does a mass movement depict the present as mean and miserable, it deliberately makes it so. It fashions a pattern of individual existence that is dour, hard, repressive, and dull. It decries pleasures and comforts and extols the rigorous life. It views ordinary enjoyment as trivial or even discreditable and represents the pursuit of personal happiness as immoral. To enjoy oneself is to have truck with the enemy, the present. The prime objective of the ascetic ideal preached by most movements is to breed contempt for the present. And this is a theme we see over and over in in the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, e- even having a hobby in your spare time is pretty questionable. Why aren't you using that time to go out and service? And the rigorous schedule, there's so many tasks to do to be a good Jehovah's Witness that it really does cut off any much opportunity for uh, enjoyment and all your hope for a beautiful life is shifted to a distant uh, future. Now, the other side of that coin is, as he writes in the next section, 49, he says, there can be no genuine deprecation of the present without the assured hope of a better future. He continues, all mass movements deprecate the present by depicting it as a mean preliminary to a glorious future, a mere doormat on the threshold of the millennium. To a religious movement, the present is a place of exile, a veil of tears leading to the heavenly kingdom. To a social revolution, it is a mean way station on the road to utopia. To a nationalist movement, it is an ignoble episode preceding the final triumph. And that future hope is very strong for witnesses. As 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, The things seen are temporary, the things unseen are everlasting. In section 50, he writes that although a mass movement may initially forget about the past and focus all everything on the future, usually they will return to the past and kind of link it together with the future as a kind of this continuous flow of awesomeness that the organizations had. He writes, an historical awareness also imparts a sense of continuity. Possessed of a vivid vision of past and future, the true believer sees himself part of something that stretches endlessly backward and forward, something eternal. He can let go of the present and of his own life, not only because it is a poor thing, hardly worth hanging on to, but also because it is not the beginning and the end of all things. And we see this, uh, I think, in the past few decades, especially in the organization, there's they've had a big emphasis on considering our spiritual heritage. And there's that historical displays at many of the branch offices, including at Warwick, a very carefully curated um, history of the organization, how awesome it is, how you can trace it right back to Abel, the original witness of Jehovah. And then the chain, the unbroken chain stretches right through the Middle Ages somehow and into the millennium to come. And again, he writes that, viewing things on such a grand cosmic scale, the if we have to lose our own life along the way, it's such an unimportant thing that it, it becomes much easier to do so. In section 56, Hoffer writes a really interesting section on the importance of doctrine. 
He says, all active mass movements strive, therefore, to interpose a fact-proof screen between the faithful and the realities of the world. They do this by claiming that the ultimate and absolute truth is already embodied in their doctrine, and that there is no truth nor certitude outside it. The facts on which the true believer bases his conclusions must not be derived from his experience or observation, but from holy writ. So tenaciously should we cling to the world revealed by the gospel that, were I to see all the angels of heaven coming down to me to tell me something different, not only would I not be tempted to doubt a single syllable, but I would shut my eyes and stop my ears, for they would not deserve to be either seen or heard. Quoting Martin Luther there. He goes on, To rely on the evidence of the senses and of reason is heresy and treason. It is startling to realize how much unbelief is necessary to make belief possible. What we know as blind faith is sustained by innumerable unbeliefs. The fanatical Japanese in Brazil refused to believe for years the evidence of Japan's defeat. The fanatical communist refuses to believe any unfavorable report or evidence about Russia, nor will he be disillusioned by seeing with his own eyes the cruel misery inside the Soviet promised land. It is the true believer's ability to shut his eyes and stop his ears to facts that do not deserve to be either seen or heard, which is the source of his unequaled fortitude and constancy. He cannot be frightened by danger, nor disheartened by obstacles, nor baffled by contradictions, because he denies their existence. Strength of faith, as Bergson pointed out, manifests itself not in moving mountains, but in not seeing mountains to move. And it is the certitude of his infallible doctrine that renders the true believer impervious to the uncertainties, surprises, and the unpleasant realities of the world around him. Again, very true of Jehovah's Witnesses as of other mass movements. In the Mormon Stories uh, podcast, they refer to this as the backfire effect, that attacking somebody head-on with why all the 47 reasons why their belief is wrong and they should quit that belief uh, oftentimes just makes people dig their heels in harder and close their ears and their faith gets stronger after after hearing what you're saying. And so th- usually that's not the most effective way to try and reach out to somebody that you care about. Unfortunately, <laughs> speaking from experience, you le- usually learn that a bit too late, but it's still a good lesson. In section 58, he points out that the doctrine also needs to be able to uh, give the impression that it answers everything. It it offers solutions for any possible thing that could come up. He writes, To be in possession of an absolute truth is to have a net of familiarity spread over the whole of eternity. There are no surprises and no unknowns. All questions have already been answered. All decisions made. All eventualities foreseen. The true believer is without wonder and hesitation. And he goes on, An active mass movement rejects the present and centers its interest on the future. It is from this attitude that it derives its strength, for it can proceed recklessly with the present, with the health, wealth, and lives of its followers. But it must act as if it had already read the book of the future to the last word. Its doctrine is proclaimed as a key to that book. In section 59, he he draws a connection that often true believers have a, a certain strain of uh, credulity that they will cultivate in themselves so that once they're past a certain point, they will come to believe things, even if they're more questionable uh, that the organization is saying. And then a side point he makes, he writes, a peculiar side of credulity is that it is often joined with a proneness to imposture. The association of believing and lying is not characteristic solely of children. The inability or unwillingness to see things as they are promotes both gullibility and charlatanism. And I think we see a little, uh, helps to explain a little bit this idea of uh, theocratic warfare, as Jehovah's Witnesses refer to it, or lying for the Lord, as Latter-day Saints refer to it, this idea of stretching the truth or even lying outright in order to protect the movement makes more sense when we look at it from this angle of credulity. In section 64, he he discusses the similarities and the differences between an army and a mass movement. And it's an interesting section, but one point jumped out at me in particular. He writes, the mass movement comes to destroy the present. 
Its preoccupation is with the future, and it derives its vigor and drive from this preoccupation. When a mass movement begins to be preoccupied with the present, it means that it has arrived. It ceases then to be a movement and becomes an institutionalized organization, an established church, a government, or an army. And I think we'll talk about this a little later on in the book, but I just thought it was an interesting point that a mass movement can shift from its focus on the future to its focus on the present. And in some sense, it ceases to be a mass movement. It loses some of that vigor and excitement that it had. And it seems like the Watchtower Society is sort of in that kind of messy middle ground right now. Initially, it had that real drive and vigor of uh, the generation wouldn't pass away before the new world came and there was a lot of excitement for the near future. And yet here we are now 140 odd years later and still waiting, still in this attitude of readiness. And when the bo- you know when a human body has that fight or flight response, when it's constantly revved up full of cortisol and that eventually becomes unhealthy if its stress response is, is revved up like that. Uh, or I guess like the Bible says, expectation postponed is making the heart sick. And it is getting bogged down in these present day matters of budgets and real estate and lawsuits. And it just makes you wonder, will they eventually become like Seventh-day Adventists or the Latter-day Saints where initially they did have that same very similar, very millennial end times theology. And over the decades, that's just kind of faded into the far background for those religions and will Jehovah's Witnesses do something similar or will they end up just kind of fizzling out because without that part of the religion there's just not that much left in the next chapter he talks about some unifying agents or qualities that are important for a successful mass movement interestingly the first one he mentions is the quality of hatred which I had to see explained but it makes sense that any good mass movement has an object uh, which it blames all its bad things on, uh, some sort of devil that it can point to. And uh, obviously for Jehovah's Witnesses, they have the literal devil as well as all his agents on the earth. Hoffer writes that, again, like an ideal deity, the ideal devil is omnipotent and omnipresent. When Hitler was asked whether he was not attributing rather too much importance to the Jews, he exclaimed, No, no, no. It is impossible to exaggerate the formidable quality of the Jew as an enemy. Unquote. Hoffer writes, Every difficulty and failure within the movement is the work of the devil, and every success is a triumph over his evil plotting. And so this helps to explain the... Well, first of all, the literal obsession with Satan the devil that Jehovah's Witnesses have, you know, the great fear witnesses have of of buying a demonized object, uh, even a Smurf doll, could be a a tool of the devil. And then we see kind of the disjointed response that Jehovah's Witnesses have to their coverage in the media, that all all nice stories are true, but all critical, all bad stories are lies. And that's because of the devil. In section 70 and 71, he writes that another facet of a mass movement having hatred as an important quality is hatred of those who leave the movement. He writes, To wrong those we hate is to add fuel to our hatred. Conversely, to treat an enemy with magnanimity is to blunt our hatred for him. The most effective way to silence our guilty conscience is to convince ourselves and others that those we have sinned against are indeed depraved creatures deserving every punishment, even extermination. We cannot pity those we have wronged, nor can we be indifferent toward them. We must hate and persecute them, or else leave the door open to self-contempt. And this, I think, helps to explain the treatment of uh, apostates, that Jehovah's Witnesses have and extends to family members that leave the organization, treating family members that are disfellowshipped or disassociated. You know, looking at that objectively, you would feel very guilty for treating a child or a parent in that way. And so put great hatred on those who leave the organization. 
We can give no quarter to the enemy. In section 73, he makes the point that there is a cost of uh, cultivating this hatred. He writes, thus, though hatred is a convenient instrument for mobilizing a community for defense, it does not in the long run come cheap. We pay for it by losing all or many of the values we have set out to defend. And we see that in the organization that parents learn to have conditional love for their children. They'll be ready at any moment to shut off their love if it's necessary. They learn to uh, be ready to let their children die. In effect, they learn to practice child sacrifice, which is kind of ironic considering how Jehovah killed off the nations of Canaan for practicing child sacrifice. But that's what witness parents learn to have happen instead of letting their children receive blood transfusions. So the, these valuable basic human uh, values are lost in the need to uh, cultivate this hatred. And interestingly, he writes that when the movement itself receives hatred from others, that is a good thing. That's a sign that uh, things are progressing as they should. He writes, there is a deep reassurance for the frustrated in witnessing the downfall of the fortunate and the disgrace of the righteous. They see in a general downfall an approach to the brotherhood of all. Chaos like the grave is a haven of equality. Their burning conviction that there must be a new life and a new order is fueled by the realization that the old will have to be raised to the ground before the new can be built. Their clamor for a millennium is shot through with a hatred for all that exists and a craving for the end of the world. In section 77, he returns to the idea that being a true believer doesn't equal being a humble person, and this can make hatred easier. He writes, there's also other factors which favor the growth of hatred in an atmosphere of unity and selflessness. The act of self-denial seems to confer on us the right to be harsh and merciless toward others. The impression somehow prevails that the true believer, particularly the religious individual, is a humble person. The truth is that the surrendering and humbling of the self breed pride and arrogance. The true believer is apt to see himself as one of the chosen, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a prince disguised in meekness, who is destined to inherit this earth and the kingdom of heaven too. He who is not of his faith is evil. He who will not listen shall perish. And yeah, that's that's true, I think, of many, probably not all, but many witnesses. I remember a circuit overseer one time (laughs) saying, I I think I would have made a really good Pharisee. And he was making a point that uh, that was something he always was working on, was not to be too judgmental of others. But I know that was true of me and I, I think of many other witnesses as well. In section 83, he writes that another tool as a unifying agent of a mass movement is that of uh, propaganda that's put out. But he he kind of downplays the true strength of propaganda. He writes, Propaganda by itself, however skillful, cannot keep people persuaded once they have ceased to believe. To maintain itself, a mass movement has to order things so that when the people no longer believe, they can be made to believe by force. Interestingly, the footnote to that is from Machiavelli. He writes, as we shall see later, words are an essential instrument in preparing the ground for a mass movement. But once the movement is realized, words, though still useful, cease to play a decisive role. So acknowledged a master of propaganda, as Dr. Goebbels admits in an unguarded moment that, quote, a sharp sword must always stand behind propaganda if it is to be really effective, unquote. And I think that's something we see among Jehovah's Witnesses, the threat, uh, firstly, of disfellowshipping, of never being able to see your family again or talk to them. And then that more nebulous idea that if you leave the organization, you'll never be able to see your dead loved ones again in the new system. Those are very potent swords to keep people in the organization, even when they may no longer believe much of the theology. In section 100, he talks about another interesting uh, unifying agent in a mass movement, and that is the quality of suspicion. He writes, Thus, when the frustrated congregate in a mass movement, the air is heavy laden with suspicion. There is prying and spying, tense watching and a tense awareness of being watched. 
The surprising thing is that this pathological mistrust within the ranks leads not to dissension, but to strict conformity. Knowing themselves continually watched, the faithful strive to escape suspicion by adhering zealously to prescribed behavior and opinion. Strict orthodoxy is as much the result of mutual suspicion as of ardent faith. And that is a very clear facet of life among Jehovah's Witnesses, that you have to be ready to turn each other in for wrongdoing before somebody turns you in for not turning somebody else in. He makes another uh, interesting point in section 101. He writes, Collective unity is not the result of the brotherly love of the faithful for each other. The loyalty of the true believer is to the whole, the church, party, nation, and not to his fellow true believer. True, loyal, true loyalty between individuals is possible only in a loose and relatively free society. As Abraham was ready to sacrifice his only son to prove his devotion to Jehovah, so must the fanatical Nazi or communist be ready to sacrifice relatives and friends to demonstrate his total surrender to the holy cause. The active mass movement sees in the personal ties of blood and friendship a diminution of its own corporate cohesion. Thus, mutual suspicion within the ranks is not only compatible with corporate strength, but, one might almost say, a precondition of it. Men of strong convictions and strong passions, when leagued together, watch one another with suspicion and find their strength in it. For mutual suspicion creates mutual dread, binds them as by an iron band, prevents desertion, and braces them against moments of weakness. So I just thought that was an interesting point that Again, you need to be willing to sacrifice anyone, including close, immediate family, for the cause, for the organization. And that really brotherly love doesn't drive the unity as much as suspicion does. The final part of the book talks about, well, the theme is beginning and end, and it talks about how mass movements uh, start and how they end. And he writes that the first key player found or necessary for a successful mass movement is the man of words. And this is a person that puts into words sentiments or ideas that people begin to get behind and follow. So he discusses this uh, man of words or man of ideas for some time. Just one paragraph that jumped out at me in section 105, he writes, Whatever the type, there is a deep-seated craving common to almost all men of words which determines their attitude to the prevailing order. It is a craving for recognition, a craving for a clearly marked status above the common run of humanity. Vanity, said Napoleon, made the revolution. Liberty was only a pretext. There is apparently an irremediable insecurity at the core of every intellectual, be he non-creative or creative. Even the most gifted and prolific seem to live a life of eternal self-doubting and have to prove their worth anew each day. What de Remusat said of Thiers is perhaps true of most men of words, quote, He has much more vanity than ambition, and he prefers consideration to obedience, and the appearance of power to power itself. Consult him constantly, and then do just as you please. He will take more notice of your deference to him than of your actions, unquote. And as you look at the life of Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Bible Students Movement, uh, that seems to fit him pretty well, that he was not exactly a super ambitious fellow that was actively designing to start a religion and take over the world. But he really craved that recognition, that adulation from others. I forget where I read it, but it gave the basically the idea that he really didn't mind negative publicity in the newspapers as long as he was in the newspapers and talking about things with his divorce proceedings and various lawsuits he was embroiled in. The important thing wasn't the bad publicity, but just the publicity itself. And we see echoes of that now in the way Jehovah's Witness, the organization, um, portrays Russell. For In that one video they put out a few years ago of a young Russell, they portray him almost as a, a young visionary seated in this group of admiring older men as they create the Watchtower magazine, uh, kind of echoing Jesus uh, sitting among the rabbis, the older men in the temple when he was 12 years old. <laughs> 
So in many ways, Russell was indeed this man of words, the creative idea man uh, at the beginning of the Watchtower movement. Now, the second main character that Hoffer describes in uh, any mass movement is what he calls the fanatics. And these are the second type of man that comes along to get the movement rolling. And so he writes in section 110 about the fanatic. He says, chaos is his element. When the old order begins to crack, he wades in with all his might and recklessness to blow the whole hated present to high heaven. He glories in the sight of a world coming to a sudden end. To hell with reforms. All that already exists is rubbish, and there is no sense in reforming rubbish. He justifies his will to anarchy with the plausible assertion that there can be no new beginning so long as the old clutters the landscape. He shoves aside the frightened men of words if they are still around, though he continues to extol their doctrines and mouth their slogans. He alone knows the innermost craving of the masses in action, the craving for communion, for the mustering of the host, for the dissolution of cursed individuality in the majesty and grandeur of a mighty whole. Posterity is king, and woe to those inside and outside the movement who hug and hang on to the present. (laughs) I think that well describes the turbulent years immediately after Russell's death when Joseph Rutherford came at the helm of the Watchtower Society and just a lot of chaos in those few years there in the early teens, 1900s there. And again, he certainly, as it says, paid lip service to the doctrines of Russell initially and kept much of what was there. And at the same time, discarded a lot of the structure and eventually a lot of the, the, a lot of the theology to create a, much more centralized, more anonymous organization that was very much more compact and tightly knit than anything under Russell's direction. In section 111, he, Hoffer writes about what happens to the men of words once the fanatics start to come along. He writes, the creative man of words is ill at ease in the atmosphere of an active movement. He feels that its whirl and passion sap his creative energies. So long as he is conscious of the creative flow within him, he will not find fulfillment in leading millions and in winning victories. The result is that once the movement starts rolling, he either retires voluntarily or is pushed aside. Moreover, since the genuine man of words can never wholeheartedly and for long suppress his critical faculty, he is inevitably cast in the role of a heretic. Thus, unless the creative man of words stifles the newborn movement by allying himself with practical men of action, or unless he dies at the right moment, he is likely to end up either a shunned recluse or in exile or facing a firing squad. And I guess picking from those options, we would say that Russell died at the right time. And you can just imagine if Charles Russell were to walk into a kingdom hall today and start trying to give a talk that he would be quickly (laughs) disfellowshipped from the religion that he founded. In section 112, he writes about how the fanatics can actually create schisms within a movement uh, once it gets rolling. He writes, Thus on the morrow of victory, most mass, mass movements find themselves in the grip of dissension. The ardor with which yesterday found an outlet in a life-and-death struggle with external enemies now vents itself in violent disputes and clash of factions. Hatred has become a habit. With no more outside enemies to destroy it, the fanatics make enemies of one another. He writes, If allowed to have their way, the fanatics may split a movement into schism and heresies which threaten its existence. Even when the fanatics do not breed dissension, they can still wreck the movement by driving it to attempt the impossible. Only the entrance of a practical man of action can save the achievements of the movement. And again, I think this relates well to the internal schisms that existed in the Bible students in the years after Rutherford took over, that it took years to really recover from. And Rutherford Rutherford dealt very harshly with what he viewed as disloyalty from his inner circle. For and I'm thinking of the uh, the Olin Moyle saga, where in the Bethel lawyer started to turn against and criticize Rutherford, and Rutherford dropped the hammer on him hard 
publishing articles specifically about him in the Watchtower, lawsuits and convention declarations and resolutions specifically about Olin Moyle. So, so some truth there. And then there's a third type of person that comes along in a mass movement that Eric Hoffer talks about, and he terms these the practical men of action. And we see this particularly in the third president of the Watchtower Society, Nathan Knorr. And he writes about this in section 114. The man of action saves the movement from the suicidal dissensions and the recklessness of the fanatics. But his appearance usually marks the end of the dynamic phase of the movement. The war with the present is over. The genuine man of action is intent not on renovating the world, but on possessing it. Whereas the life breath of the, di- of the dynamic phase was protest and a desire for drastic change, the final phase is chiefly preoccupied with administering and perpetuating the power one. With the appearance of the man of action, the explosive vigor of the movement is embalmed and sealed in sanctified institutions. A religious movement crystallizes in a hierarchy and a ritual, a revolutionary movement in organs of vigilance and administration, a nationalist movement in governmental and patriotic institutions. The establishment of a church marks the end of the revivalist spirit. The organs of a triumphant revolution liquidate the revolutionary mentality and technique. The governmental institutions of a new or revived nation put an end to chauvinistic belligerence. The institutions freeze a pattern of united action. The members of the institutionalized collective body are expected to act as one man, yet they must represent a loose aggregation rather than a spontaneous coalescence. They must be unified only through their unquestioning loyalty to the institutions. Spontaneity is suspect, and duty is prized above devotion. And I think that last sentence is what really hit home for me, that among Jehovah's Witnesses, doing things differently is suspect. And the most important thing is to fit in with everybody else. Duty is prized above devotion. In section 115, he writes about the man of action. Still, he cannot help being awed by the tremendous achievements of faith and spontaneity in the early days of the movement, when a mighty instrument of power was conjured out of the void. The memory of it is still extremely vivid. He takes, therefore, great care to preserve in the new institutions an impressive facade of faith and maintains an incessant flow of fervent propaganda, though he relies mainly on the persuasiveness of force. His words are worded in pious vocabulary, and the old formulas and slogans are continually on his lips. The symbols of faith are carried high and given reverence. The men of words and the fanatics of the early period are canonized. Though the steel fingers of coercion make themselves felt everywhere and great emphasis is placed on mechanical drill, the pious phrases and the fervent propaganda give to coercion a semblance of persuasion and to habit a semblance of spontaneity. No effort is spared to present the new order as the glorious consummation of the hopes and struggles of the early days. And I think a lot of that rings true for Jehovah's Witnesses that Although disfellowshipping uh, emerged in, around under Noor, the organization paid lip service to and ostensibly venerated the early customs and certainly the early leaders of the movement, uh, Russell and Rutherford, were revered. But again, spontaneity is kind of pushed off to the side, and it's all about mechanical drills and repetition uh, while using the propaganda to kind of uh, give the illusion of that spontaneity. And then later in this section, the next paragraph, he talks about how an organization will start borrowing bits and pieces, a little techniques from all over the place, from its friends and from its enemies, to maintain the organization. And we certainly see that with the Watchtower Society, that it is essentially structured like a business corporation now with its local management, its middle management, regional directors uh, reporting to a national board of directors. Um, We see in more recent years where it's introduced Christian music and cartoons and TV programs uh, imitating things that televangelists and other religions have done for for years now. In section 116, he makes an interesting point that, well, overall the movement, a movement will still 
offer that distant hope for the future that kind of soothes and palliates the masses that are members in your organization, once it's reached this stage of kind of stability and more concern for the present, there is now an opportunity for kind of career men to make their mark in the movement. And I think we see that as you look at the governing body today, that whereas previous to there, there was uh, Fred Franz, who was very much kind of a spiritual thinker, leader in the organization and just happened through his longevity and association with other leaders in the organization to become the Watchtower president for a bit. But many of the governing body now are not, they weren't known for their spiritual high thinking above everybody else and that kind of thing, but they were uh, career men who put their time in the organization, kind of worked their way up the ladder, and now are on the governing body. And so that's an interesting shift from the earlier years of the of a movement. Hoffer writes, thus at the end of its vigorous span, the movement is an instrument of power for the successful and an opiate for the frustrated. So both types can prosper in the movement. Section 117 has as the title, The Unattractiveness and Sterility of the Active Phase. So this is an interesting little section. First of all, it just describes the fanatic a little more It says the fanatic who personifies this phase is usually an unattractive human type. He is ruthless, self-righteous, credulous, disputatious, petty, and rude. He is often ready to sacrifice relatives and friends for his holy cause. And I just thought that was, seemed pretty spot on for describing uh, Joseph Rutherford from what we know of him, even to the point that his wife and son didn't bother to attend his funeral. But then uh, Hoffer goes on to discuss why it is that it seems in mass movements when they're in this active stage that there's no creative output from the members, it seems like. And I think that's certainly true among Jehovah's Witnesses. And he goes on to explain some reasons why that is. In section 118, he writes, The interference of an active mass movement with the creative process is deep-reaching and manifold. One, The fervor it generates drains the energies which would have flowed into creative work. Fervor has the same effect on creativeness as dissipation. Two, it subordinates creative work to the advancement of the movement. Literature, art, and science must be propagandistic, and they must be, quote, practical. The true believing writer, artist, or scientist does not create to express himself, or to save his soul, or to discover the true and the beautiful. His task, as he sees it, is to warn, to advise, to urge, to glorify, and to denounce. 3. Where a mass movement opens vast fields of action, war, colonization, industrialization, there is an additional drain of creative energy. 4. The fanatical state of mind by itself can stifle all forms of creative work. The fanatic's disdain for the present blinds him to the complexity and uniqueness of life. The things which stir the creative worker seem to him either trivial or corrupt. Quote, Our writers must march in serried ranks, and he who steps off the road to pick flowers is like a deserter. Unquote. Said Rabbi Jacob, 1st century AD, quote, He who walks in the way and interrupts his study of the Torah, saying, how beautiful is this tree, or how beautiful is this plowed field, has made himself guilty against his own soul. St. Bernard of Clairvaux could walk all day by the Lake of Geneva and never see the lake. In Refinement of the Arts, David Hume tells of the monk, quote, who, because the windows of his cell opened upon a noble prospect, made a covenant with his eyes never to turn that way, unquote. The blindness of the fanatic is a source of strength. He sees no obstacles, but it is the cause of intellectual sterility and emotional monotony. The fanatic is also mentally cocky and hence barren of new beginnings. At the root of his cockiness is the conviction that life and the universe conform to a simple formula, his formula. He is thus without the fruitful intervals of groping when the mind is, as it were, in solution, ready for all manner of new reactions, new combinations, and new beginnings. So I thought this was pretty spot on for Jehovah's Witnesses. We see generally when 
a person joins the witnesses and they were in some kind of creative pursuit, they'll give up their acting career, their musical career, their sports career once they join the witnesses. There's really no famous Jehovah's Witness authors or actors that are still active witnesses. And he is, so this goes to explain why that just all that energy, that creative energy is sucked up by the movement. And if somebody did try to put out creative pursuits, uh, put their energy as in that way, they would really be kind of viewed with suspicion by other witnesses as wasting their time and not being truly dedicated to the movement. And as he makes the point at the end there that creative pursuits really make no sense to the fanatic because the movement has all the answers. There's nothing to puzzle out or, or reflect on. And we hear that sentiment sometimes that, well, you can do that in the new system because we'll be perfect and we'll be able to write better than Shakespeare and play music better than famous musicians and compose better than Beethoven, that kind of thing. And so all those creative pursuits are just pushed off to the side and slowly wither away. In section 120, he discusses the idea, some factors which determine the length of the active phase. And he writes thus, a mass movement with a concrete limited objective is likely to have a shorter active phase than a movement with a nebulous indefinite objective. The vague objective is perhaps indispensable for the development of chronic extremism. Said Oliver Cromwell, quote, a man never goes so far as when he does not know whether, whither he is going, unquote. When a mass movement is set in motion to free a nation from tyranny, either domestic or foreign, or to resist an aggressor, or to renovate a backward society, there is a natural point of termination once the struggle with the enemy is over, or the process of reorganization is nearing completion. On the other hand, when the objective is an ideal society of perfect unity and selflessness, whether it be the city of God, a communist heaven on earth, or Hitler's warrior state, the active phase is without an automatic end. So this I thought was kind of an interesting point, because always in my head, at reading the earlier in the book, I thought, well, this idea that witnesses are always on tenor hooks, where the end is always just a little bit more around the corner and being in that state of constant readiness may cause it to fizzle out. But here he makes the point that it is possible that a movement without a definite end point, just kind of a nebulous future sometime down the road that may actually allow it to last longer. It may just kind of continue puttering along for, for who knows how long. In section 123, he makes another interesting point about how long a mass movement may last. And he says it relates to the way that the mass movement started, whether they were rebelling against a specific authority. And he makes the point that if that's how the movement started, that uh, once that initial push is over, the members of the movement will start to develop that own sense of autonomy and rebellion against authority, against the movement itself, and the movement will kind of fizzle out at that point. However, he, he's saying that if the movement started rather organically without a set point of rebellion, that can ena actually enable it to last for a long, long time. He writes, the more clear-cut this initial act of defiance and the more vivid its memory in the minds of the people, the more likely is the eventual emergence of individual liberty. There was no such clear-cut act of defiance in the rise of Christianity. It did not start by overthrowing a king, a hierarchy, a state, or a church. Martyrs there were, but not individuals shaking their fists under the nose of proud authority and defying it in the view of the whole world. Hence, perhaps the fact that the authoritarian order ushered in by Christianity endured almost unchallenged for 1,500 years. The eventual emancipation of the Christian mind at the time of the Renaissance in Italy drew its inspiration not from the history of early Christianity, but from the stirring examples of individual independence and defiance in the Greco-Roman past. So this is a, <laughs> another interesting point that weighs in favor of maybe witnesses the witness movement will just last indefinitely because there was no, it just sort of started quietly and grew and grew organically. And so members of Jehovah's Witnesses don't really have that sense of 
rebellion or fighting against the man that uh, certain other movements do. Witnesses are not, for the most part, a very feisty group of people. So feisty. And that's pretty much the end of the book there. I would definitely recommend it if you want to check it out yourself. It's worth a, worth the read. And it's really not very long. It's only about 250 pages. All right. Well, thanks very much for watching. Be well, and we'll catch you in the next video. Take care.